Numerous films have attempted to depict the brutal nature of mafia leaders, but there has been a noticeable gap in portraying the cruelty inflicted upon vulnerable communities by loan sharks who collaborate with the mafia. In this video, we will delve deeply into the life of Angelo the Hook La Pietra, a notorious loan shark whose moniker stems from the harrowing methods he employed to torment his targets. Getting Hooked, unraveling the legacy of Angelo the Hook La Pietra. To truly grasp the enigmatic persona of Angelo the Hook La Pietra, we must rewind the clock by 13 years to 2010. It may strike you as unconventional that our narrative commences with the demise of our central character. However, please bear with me. In April 2010, the name Angelo the Hook La Pietra resurfaced during an FBI investigation. This isn't an uncommon occurrence, as law enforcement agencies often delve into the lives and misdeeds of infamous and deeply feared mob bosses like La Pietra long after they've departed from this world. This enduring scrutiny is due to the lasting impacts of the malevolence they sowed during their lifetimes. This phenomenon mirrors the cases of renowned criminals such as Pablo Escobar and the Chicago outfit's ultimate boss, Al Capone, whose criminal legacies persisted beyond their earthly presence. However, in La Pietra's case, the FBI's interest didn't stem from a direct investigation into his life. Throughout most of his existence, La Pietra engaged in a myriad of criminal activities with the backing of the Chicago outfit. Even after his death, it appeared that traces of his crimes lingered on, haunting his name and family. In the pivotal year of 2010, the FBI descended upon La Pietra's family residence, thoroughly upending the tranquil abode. Remarkably, at the time of this intrusion, the house still sheltered a member of the La Pietra family, Angelo's 43-year-old daughter, Joanne Lascola. Now you might wonder what drew the FBI to the dwelling of a deceased mob boss. It turned out that La Pietra's former associates within the mob unwittingly led the authorities straight to his doorstep. According to the FBI, three notorious mobsters had been lurking around the house, hatching plans to breach its defenses. In their prime, Jerry Witherhand Scalise, Arthur the Genius Rachel, and Robert Bobby Puglia were renowned for their jewelry heists and home invasions. Court records attested to their involvement in several such cases, the trio's nefarious objective was to infiltrate the residence of the former mob boss because they possessed credible information suggesting that a 45 carat Marlboro diamond was secreted within. This breathtaking gem had been initially pilfered from a jewelry store in 1980 by Scalise and Rachel. Remarkably, about three decades later, these same individuals sought to purloin it once more. Following the 1980 heist, both men had been apprehended and incarcerated, but the diamond remained elusive. It was plausible that after their initial theft, they had entrusted the jewellery to Angelo La Pietra, a well-respected mob figure at the time. Determined to reclaim what they believed was rightfully theirs, the trio bided their time until after the hook's demise before resurfacing. Their mission, however, encountered unexpected hurdles. Upon apprehending the mobsters, the FBI deemed it imperative to conduct a routine search of the La Pietra residence. The likelihood of discovering the missing diamond on the premises was high, given La Pietra's involvement in various forms of racketeering during his reign, and the arrested mobsters were convinced the gem could be found there. When federal agents arrived at the house that fateful morning, it appeared they lacked a formal search warrant. Nonetheless, Joanne La Pietra willingly permitted them entry to conduct their search. After hours of meticulously combing through every nook and cranny, the agents emerged empty-handed. The search of La Pietra's house proved far less fruitful than the one conducted at the residence of his fellow mob boss a few weeks prior. Just before the FBI's raid on La Pietra's house, they had made startling discoveries at Frank Calabrese's residence. Calabrese, like La Pietra in his lifetime, had operated as an enforcer and loan shark within the Chicago outfit. Unlike La Pietra, Calabrese was arrested in 2009. In March 2010, the FBI secured a search warrant for Frank Calabrese's home. In stark contrast to their findings at La Pietra's house, officials uncovered a substantial sum of $728,000 meticulously stacked in cash. Astonishingly, this was only the tip of the iceberg. 
the search yielded nearly a thousand pieces of jewelry, some displayed in ornate boxes, while others still bore price tags, unequivocally linking them to thefts. The discovery of such considerable sums of money at Calabresi's residence might have been anticipated, given his reputation as a loan shark who exclusively conducted business in cash. However, the magnitude of the jewelry cash discovered was genuinely astonishing. It provided irrefutable evidence of the Chicago outfit's involvement in robberies and racketeering. The search yielded yet more findings. A trove of microcassettes brimming with recordings, seven concealed firearms cloaked beneath clothing and towels, and a handful of handwritten notes and ledgers that painstakingly chronicled the mobster's gambling and extortion activities. Had it not been for the expertise of the search party, they might have missed this damning evidence against Calabresi. The mob boss had craftily concealed his ill-gotten gains and stolen gems in a hidden compartment within the wall. He had cleverly obscured the compartment with a large picture frame, creating the perfect camouflage. This momentous discovery within Calabresi's abode compelled the FBI to extend their investigative reach to La Pietra's residence, despite his long-deceased status. ABC Eyewitness News eloquently encapsulated the situation in an article that began as follows. La Pietra has been dead for 11 years, but for many it seems he has found no respite. This may appear to be a straightforward observation one might make about any Mafia affiliate. However, for La Pietra, it holds a unique truth. You see, La Pietra is a somewhat overlooked malefactor in the annals of mob infamy. To fully comprehend why, one needs only listen to the tales of his misdeeds, even 11 years after his passing. Angelo the Hook La Pietra, from petty criminal to ruthless mob enforcer. Born in October 1920 to first-generation Italian immigrants from Naples, Italy, Angelo J. La Pietra, better known as the Hook, embarked on a life of crime from a young age. His early police records reveal a penchant for car thefts and burglaries, actions that set him on a path towards becoming a hardened gangster. As a teenager, he quickly graduated from petty crimes to a life of organized crime, finding his niche within the Chicago outfit. La Pietra's criminal career blossomed rapidly within the ranks of the Chicago outfit, where his expertise in burglaries and thefts proved invaluable. In a short span, he ascended to a prominent position within the criminal organization, soon becoming a high-ranking member. During his prime, La Pietra was deeply involved in a string of heinous crimes, including kidnappings, murders, narcotics trafficking, and loan sharking. The 1970s and 1980s witnessed La Pietra's ascendancy as the head of the Chinatown Southside Crew, also known as the 26th Street Crew. At this time, Chinatown teemed with immigrants who had a penchant for gambling, providing La Pietra with the perfect opportunity to establish a network of illegal casinos. These establishments attracted unwitting immigrants who flocked to have a good time, unknowingly filling La Pietra's coffers. While the casinos proved profitable, the crew primarily thrived on extensive loan sharking operations. Loan sharks, as a rule, extend loans to individuals in need, but with exorbitant interest rates attached. Beyond these usurious interest rates, loan sharks are infamous for their willingness to employ extreme violence against those unable to repay their debts promptly. These ruthless criminals employ a range of tactics, from brutal physical beatings to forcibly seizing debtors' properties. Among this perilous profession, La Pietra stood out as one of the most brutal and sadistic loan sharks in history. As previously mentioned, while loan sharks typically employ violence to intimidate debtors, La Pietra took brutality to horrifying extremes. He was notorious for employing a gruesome signature technique, hanging his gagged victims on a meat hook, the piercing pain of which would sear through their rib cages. Subsequently, he would torture these unfortunate individuals to their deaths using a blowtorch. In most cases, the agony would become so unbearable that the victims would succumb, not from the physical injuries inflicted, but from being suffocated by their own agonized screams. This macabre method earned him the chilling moniker, The Hook. However, there's more to La Pietra's epithet than just his horrific torture technique. It is believed that once someone accepted a loan from him, they were ensnared by his hooks. Following the initial loan, La Pietra craftily manipulated his victims into seeking additional loans 
or coerce them into putting valuable properties and businesses as collateral. Despite his infamy, it's worth noting that La Pietra may not have been the most ruthless loan shark affiliated with the Chicago outfit. In the 1960s, Samuel Mad Sam De Stefano worked as a loan shark for the outfit, and his actions defied ordinary comprehension. Charging victims 20 to 25% interest per week, De Stefano had a sadistic streak that set him apart. He lent money to individuals he knew would be unable to repay, including drug addicts and failing businessmen. When loans remained unpaid, De Stefano would lead his victims to a soundproof torture chamber in his basement, where he mercilessly beat them to death. La Pietra's reputation extended beyond loan sharking. He was a strict enforcer for the Chicago outfit and played a pivotal role in numerous criminal operations, particularly in Cicero, Illinois. For the Cicero operations, he served as a top enforcer for his boss, Joseph Ayupa, known as Joey Doves. His crew consisted of equally ruthless individuals who ensured that everyone within the area adhered to his tax system. Those who dared to defy the crew met brutal fates, serving as grim examples to others. Additionally, La Pietra was a formidable assassin for the outfit, often tasked with high-profile hits, including the assassinations of Anthony and Michael Spilotro, prominent mob bosses of the 1980s. Notably, La Pietra was not the sole member of the La Pietra family affiliated with the Chicago outfit. His younger brother, James Jimmy the Lapper La Pietra, also had ties to the mob. While James primarily engaged in burglary, theft, and labor racketeering, Angelo stood at the pinnacle of organized crime, wielding significant power and influence. Angelo La Pietra's notoriety allowed him to act with near impunity, secure in the knowledge that the Chicago outfit provided protection and wielded influence in law enforcement and the judiciary. This protection ensured that investigations into his activities often led to dead ends, leaving him untouched by the law. The Chicago outfit, tracing its origins back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries, emerged as a formidable force in organized crime. Street gangs initially vied for control over different areas of Chicago, with the South Side Gang eventually evolving into the Chicago Outfit. Throughout its history, the Outfit engaged in various illegal enterprises, initially focusing on racketeering, prostitution, brothels, and gambling houses. However, under the leadership of figures like Al Capone, they transitioned into large-scale bootlegging during the Prohibition era, cementing their influence and reach. As the years passed, the Chicago outfit diversified into a multitude of illicit businesses, with loan sharking proving to be one of their most lucrative ventures. In this capacity, they supported loan sharks by providing them with resources, protection, and the means to instill fear and extract exorbitant interest rates. La Pietra was just one of many loan sharks operating under the outfit's auspices. Notable counterparts included Frank Calabrese and Robert Panozzo, who shared the same ruthless path. Calabrese, a loan shark for the 26th Street crew, answered directly to Angelo La Pietra. His crew dispensed loans with staggering interest rates, often reaching 10% per week. Their enforcement tactics were relentless, involving the seizure of cars, homes, properties, and businesses of debtors unable to meet their obligations. Calabrese's family, including his sons Frank Calabrese Jr., Kurt Calabresi and his brother Nick Calabresi was deeply enmeshed in the criminal underworld. However, their criminal endeavors ultimately led to their indictment and incarceration. Robert Panozzo, another notorious loan shark, was affiliated with the outfit's Grand Avenue crew. His modus operandi mirrored La Pietra's in its ruthlessness. Notably, Panozzo's downfall began when he loaned $40,000 to a businessman under the pretense of a repayment plan. When the victim paid a substantial sum, Panozzo, feeling unsatisfied, resorted to intimidation and violence to extract more money. This escalated into a series of violent acts, including the destruction of the victim's property. In 2019, Panozzo finally faced justice, pleading guilty to extortion conspiracy and receiving a 14-year prison sentence. In the criminal world, the actions of loan sharks often catch up with them, regardless of their perceived invincibility. Angelo, the hook, La Pietra, was no exception to this rule, as his criminal activities eventually led to his downfall. 
When the time came for him to face justice, he did not stand alone in his fall from grace. La Pietra's downfall, the demise of a ruthless mobster. By 1977, Angelo La Pietra had amassed substantial wealth, allowing him to construct a fortress-like home. His residence was fortified with a six-foot-high fence and floodlights that illuminated the surroundings at night. While La Pietra reveled in the comforts of his new abode, law enforcement agencies caught wind of his illicit activities and his role within the Chicago outfit. An investigation was swiftly launched to uncover the source of his seemingly ill-gotten riches, marking the beginning of the end for La Pietra. The investigation proved fruitful, as a few months later, authorities identified La Pietra as a key figure in the Chicago outfit's loan-sharking operation. They believed he held a leadership role in the outfit's car theft operations and deemed him among the top three criminals in Chicago, operating under the auspices of Joseph Ayupa, a well-known and feared local mob chairman. Furthermore, La Pietra's criminal portfolio extended beyond loan sharking. He was also recognized as one of the outfit's premier assassins. According to a government informant, La Pietra, along with three other mob assassins, allegedly tortured and murdered William Petricelli, a high-ranking mob boss. The informant asserted that the hit on Petricelli was ordered by another mob boss, Joseph Fariola, due to Petricelli withholding significant profits belonging to the mob. However, the early 1980s marked a dramatic turning point in La Pietra's life. A five-year FBI operation known as Strawman, initially focused on investigating the death of a Kansas City, Missouri mobster, expanded into a comprehensive probe into organized crime in Chicago. This operation led to the indictment of several mobsters and mob bosses, including Joseph Ayupa, Jackie the Lackey Cerrone, and Angelo La Pietra. The gravity of Operation Strawman became evident when the FBI revealed that they had amassed approximately 12,000 hours of recorded phone conversations through wiretaps over the course of five years. The wiretaps targeted well-known mob bosses in various states, including Kansas, Missouri, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Nevada. These conversations were meticulously recorded and used as crucial evidence against the mob bosses. While these mobsters faced indictment in connection with a murder case, La Pietra remained unaware of the impending storm. A grand jury in Kansas formally accused him of skimming around $2 million in gambling profits from Las Vegas casinos. Skimming entails embezzling money from a business before it is officially recorded or taxed. Authorities contended that these casinos were controlled by the mob, affording them the ability to skim significant sums. This illicit practice allowed the casinos to underreport their actual earnings, thereby reducing their tax liabilities. In 1981, it is believed that La Pietra used the proceeds from skimming to relocate his operations from West 26th Street to the old neighborhood Italian American Club. However, his legal battle was marred by numerous delays, including the denial of a request by his attorney, Louis Carbonara, to transcribe and provide FBI tapes to the defendants to aid their case. The U.S. Department of Justice's Organized Crime Strike Force cited the complexity of transcribing recordings conducted in multiple jurisdictions as the reason for their refusal. The protracted trial, one of the longest in organized crime history, concluded in January 1986. La Pietra, alongside Joseph Ayupa and Jackie Cerrone, entered guilty pleas for conspiring to conceal ownership in a syndicate-controlled Las Vegas casino. Cerrone and Ayupa received sentences of 28.5 years in prison, along with substantial fines. La Pietra, on the other hand, was sentenced to 16 years in prison and faced a substantial fine. Initially imprisoned in Connecticut, La Pietra's circumstances changed in 1988 when his brother Jimmy and one of his soldiers, known as Shorty, were apprehended while attempting to smuggle his favorite Italian food into the prison. Following this incident, La Pietra was transferred to a more secure facility in Virginia, where he served his entire sentence. In October 1996, while still incarcerated, La Pietra received an award from the 25th Ward Alderman, Danny Solis. The award recognized his leadership and contributions to the community, acknowledging him and members of the Italian club as influential decision-makers who had positively impacted their community. 
Angelo LaPietra was released from prison in 1997, but by 1999, he passed away of natural causes. He was laid to rest at the Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, a burial ground that also houses the remains of numerous other mob bosses. For some, Angelo LaPietra's death signaled a victory in the battle against organized crime in Chicago. However, for the LaPietra family, it marked the beginning of a new chapter filled with troubles that would come to haunt Joanne Lascola, La Pietra's daughter. Eleven years after his passing, the government continued its relentless efforts to dismantle the Chicago outfit and put an end to the heinous crimes committed by figures like Angelo La Pietra. Despite the passage of time, the continued existence of the outfit and its members posed an enduring threat to the city and its residents. Many hoped that the FBI would succeed in eradicating the Mafia's influence once and for all. While Angelo LaPietra's notoriety was undeniable, he was by no means the most brutal criminal in history. 